Hey everyone, uh, welcome to a special edition of the Simply Statistics podcast. Um, I'm sitting here today with Jeff Leake, my co-editor at the blog, and we have our special guest here, Stephen Salzberg, who's a professor of medicine and biostatistics at Johns Hopkins University. Um, and so we're gonna talk, today we're going to talk about a couple of uh, recent events in the news, so Jeff, want to take it over? Sure, so uh, we're going to be talking about the ENCODE project, which uh, for people that don't know about that, there was a big sort of uh, press release. It's been in the New York Times. It's been all sort of in the scientific news as well. And so um, we thought we'd sort of get Stephen's opinion because he knows a lot about these sorts of things. So I think we'd, we wanted to sort of start off with, for people that don't know about what the ENCODE project is, could you kind of give a brief summary, as you know, from your perspective about what the ENCODE project is and did? Well, originally it was, it stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. Right. And originally in 2003, it was started as a pilot project, not too big. And the idea was to uh, characterize everything about the DNA sequence in the genome uh, functionally as best in any way we could. So come up with new experiments, new protocols that would let us figure out what the genome's function is. And it was focused in the pilot phase on 1% of the genome. So that was why it was a pilot. So develop new methods to figure out what the DNA is doing, not just the traditional genes part, the protein coding part, but regulatory elements or any other kind of elements that we might discover. So there was a three-year pilot. Um, it was um, kind of an interesting experiment. I was involved in it at the time. I wasn't funded, but I was involved in it and it went to the meetings. Um, and some relatively new techniques were tried out and applied to you know, a small percentage of the genome. It focused on, in particular on 30 megabases of the genome, 30, about 1%, and they were in 44 regions that were defined. Everybody worked in the same regions. Okay. And then they decided, oh, this was so good that we'll expand it. So then in three years later, they expanded it. There was no real sort of thoughtful decision that it was really okay. a huge success, but it was expanded, and um, it's been expanded more since then. So um, now it's supposedly the same methods and others are being applied to the whole genome. So okay. basically figure out everything about how DNA works at every location on the genome. Okay. And so the original pilot project uh, had these 44 regions that were sort of picked by the people that sort of, uh, by the ENCODE project sort of consortium, yeah. and, and they and weren't we, all necessarily genes that code for proteins and things like that. They, they could have been sort of, or they were sort of a, a broader... They were, they were picked as sort of a mix of randomly selected, so some of them were just random 44, uh, the 44 regions. Each of them was on the order of a half a megabase to three quarters of a megabase. Okay. And some of them are random, but they intentionally chose some to be uh, covering genes that people really cared about. So some of them are very, very much non-random. Right. But that's sort of it. Right. And so then, so we had the pilot phase. Then they, in 2007, they expanded it to the to the whole genome using these sort of same techniques. But like you said, they added a few extra techniques yeah. as well. And then, so that project went. So that, that was 2007. Now it's two, 2012. And yesterday, sort of a whole pile of papers came out about the ENCODE project, sort of simultaneously. And at the same time, there was sort of all this sort of press attention around the ENCODE project. And so there, we had a couple of questions about it. One is, how do you think they, co I mean, this is kind of an amazing thing that they coordinated 30 papers. What do you think, <laughs> I, it's hard enough to coordinate the scientists on one paper. So how, right. first of all, what do you think about that sort of process of embargoing and coordinating all of the papers to come out at you know, the same time I mean, it's been good in terms of press for them, right? So. Um, well, I, I agree with you on that. It works well right. for the uh, purposes of funders and for the journals because right. you get this mass of papers all appearing at once, and so you get a lot of people interested all at once. Right. Um, and you have a press release, and you're able to get the New York Times to write a big story about it. Scientifically, this isn't how science works, so I, right. I don't really uh, think it's a very good strategy. Right. Uh, so what happened, I have a lot of colleagues who are working on various parts of it, and, and what happened was some people could have been publishing papers a year ago, and they okay. just kind of waited. So it slows things okay. down to try because you got to like synchronize everything. I see. That doesn't make sense. We don't sort of time science so that all these results will happen at once. I mean, right. just the fact that 30 papers on the same data appeared at once should tell you that somebody was holding back. I mean, they had to be. They didn't all just coincidentally finish their results and write them up and get the revisions done on the same day. Right. So there's that going on, that sort of politics. And if it's all very narrow, kind of technical work, you know, maybe it doesn't matter if it's delayed by a few months. Right. So they can all be together, get more of an impact. So, uh, so, so anyway, that's how that happens. I've been part of these consortia. Um, 
the reason people go along with it is that you kind of have to, because you know it's going to happen. So it's sort of it's clear. You mean you mean at the time that you agree to be part of the project, you sort of know in the end. Well, there was a happening. there were a couple of earlier encode papers, and they appeared okay. in like Science and Nature. Right. And so everybody wants to be on a paper in a big journal, right? An excited journal. So you got to play along if you want your paper to be part of the package. So by getting thirty papers, they were able to give many more people first authorship positions than they usually can. Right. So. You could always just go it alone and right. say, I'm going to just write my paper later. But the journals had all worked out this deal with the consortium that they would publish these papers. So Which that's like, even if, you, even if you had wanted to go it alone, you kind of couldn't, you know, the, the journals and the, was it sort of, would it, that have been hard to go alone, take some of the data and write your own paper, or do you think? Or? I'm not sure whether you would have been able to publish before the consortium. They might I have see. said you're not allowed to. You like could have said going to go a little later on my own time scale. I see. Um, but then you'd be on your own, and the journals wouldn't be sort of expediting review and handling it in some organized way. Now, isn't there an element, I mean, so one thing that they released was, the, was a lot of the data, right? Is that right? Right. Uh, now, now, once the data's out there, then you're kind of, and anyone's kind of free to look at it and maybe publish their own paper. So I guess one advantage to sticking with the embargo is that, um, you know, the data is not, if someone releases all the data, then, it's, then everyone's got to rush to kind of get their That's paper. That's right. right. So, well, so there's, there's a bit of a, let's call it a fiction, that okay. surrounds the ENCODE data. There's a lot of data. Some of it's yeah. very valuable data. And ENCODE has been, like the Human Genome Project before it, also funded by the same part of NIH, NHGRI, they've been committed to rapid release of data. And they have put the data up on websites and FTP sites for people to, to look at okay. pretty quickly. Not Be always, before right? the papers were published. It's been up. Yeah. Some of it's been up for a couple of years. Right. But What's not widely known, because they don't really like to advertise this, is that you can't write a paper with that data. You okay. can't use that data. So it's been available, and so the, the generators of the data can say, we're releasing it, and NIH can say it's being released to the scientific community very quickly, but not really. Yeah. So you right. can't write papers on it. And you can't correlate it sort of with your own data. Or you could, but it's sort no, of in-house, and you, have to wait. you couldn't publish it. If you had a, some independent data... And that data was even confirming it. I think they would say, no, you can't use our data until our papers appear. Okay. But is it, do you think that that's sort of fair in the sense that, you know, they put a lot of resources and time and stuff into generating these data. They sort of want the credit for, I don't know, publishing it first or something like that. I don't no, know. I don't so, think it's fair. Okay. Because... And I'll tell you why. Okay. That, that'd be perfect. I'll tell you why it's not fair. <laughs> if this were funded by a regular investigator-initiated grant, okay. like an R01, right. Then I would say, you know, when you have your own grant and you've got some hypothesis you're pursuing, you're collecting data, you've already demonstrated by in the process of writing the proposal and getting it funded in this incredibly competitive environment right. that you have some special ability to do this work and, and you should get some time to look at your data that you've just generated to, to publish it. This was not that kind of a project. This are, okay. These are not hypothesis-driven projects. They're data collection projects. Okay. And they are getting much bigger grants than normal grants. Yeah, right. And the whole model is, and the reason that scientists generally go along with this model, this model was sort of created for the Human Genome Project, is that they're creating a resource, and it's more efficient to create the resource in one place. So if you're going to do a lot of sequencing, mm -hmm. let's just say it's sequencing, it could, in this case it was more like ChIP-seq, RNA-seq, other things, but if you're going to do a lot of sequencing, then you get economies of scale by doing it all in one place. So it's cheaper. So right. we all get this data, which is being made available, mm -hmm. for less money if it'll be done in a small number of places rather than having every mom and pop lab do their own. Right. Right. So the community kind of bought into that for the Human Genome Project, saying, oh, it's okay to generate the data at a few big centers right. because everybody's going to get to use it and it'll be better quality by have, and cheaper by having the data done in this way. And code is in that, in that model. But not quite. So they're generating lots of RNA-seq data and chip-seq data and methylation data, which isn't really just a raw resource. And there's a lot of other things about the experiments that are important, about experimental design that are important. Mm -hmm. But they weren't reviewed in the normal way. They were reviewed in this, it was a special set aside for the ENCODE project. It had its own request for applications and the money was going to be de dedicated to generating this data. I so I think if you're going to be funded that way, right. you should release the data right away. Okay. No restrictions, because you're funded because you're good at generating this data cheaply. Like you're right. very efficient at running a sequencing shop, right. for example. Right. But you may not be the best person to do the analysis. Yeah. So we're not giving you the money because you've put the whole package together. You didn't. You didn't write that kind of a proposal. 
We're giving you the money because you can generate the data efficiently, and we like that, but you have to agree to let the rest of it, at least right. supposedly, you're agreeing to let everybody right. share in it. And they did that, but only in this sort of slightly superficial way, which yeah. is that you can see the data, but you can't publish on it. Huh. Okay, so that, that kind of brings me to the next question, which is some people have been talking about how, like you said, this is a resource rather than a discovery-based sort of science. You know, you're generating a data set that's going to be a resource for the broader community. But, but the press coverage has been more about the discovery rather than the resource, sort of, about the of discovery of 80% of, you know, junk DNA is functional has been the kind of the headline, which is also part of the press release that they issued. In the paper. And part, was it's, it in the paper? It's I, okay. the first bullet point in the summary paper. It's, right. It's their biggest finding. Right. And then, but later it sort of has come out that maybe functional means biochemically, you know, transcribed or something like that, but not necessarily functionally identified, what the function of that particular element hasn't right. necessarily right. been identified. So do you think that there's some, you know, the press coverage has sort of been all about this rather than the resource. Do you think that that has been because of the way it was presented or because, you know, the the, the sort of the scientific press that cares about the discovery and not the resource or because it seems like that's a lot of the issue a lot of people are talking about this difference between what it is and what the press is talking well, about well in order to get a paper published in nature even though they agreed ahead of time that nature was going to publish right. it so there's a bit of a friction there <laughs> right you have to have some biological discoveries the editors right. and reviewers want discoveries right so I can't recall ever reading a paper in Nature where they just said, well, we generate some data, here it is. Mm -hmm. Right. You've got to find something in it. Okay. Even if it's just a genome, you have to find, what did you discover? Right. What did you learn about the human species when you sequence a human genome? What did you learn about Rabidopsis when you sequenced that? Right. I, I was on those papers. So I know <laughs> these journal editors were always saying, tell us about the biology, and now the bar is much, much higher for yeah. genome papers. So they knew they had to come up with a story, okay. so they came up with a bunch of stories about what they discovered. It looks to me like they didn't discover anything really that striking. In terms of but what we had already known we are, yeah. up until now. That's right. Okay. So I haven't read the 30 papers. Right. <laughs> There's a lot of papers. <laughs> it was yesterday. There are a lot of papers to read. I've so. read part of the main paper. That's all. But I'll be so very surprised if there's any big discoveries in here. Okay. Do you think that maybe those discoveries will come later because of the analysis from, from other, you know, other people? Because I don't know. Resources like GEO, <clears throat> you know, microarray resources like GEO or you know, the SRA or, or things like that, sort of have these data sets that now discoveries are being made on the basis of public data by analysts you know, who didn't generate the data. So. so the answer to that depends on the quality of the data, which we all have to now look at to right. see. If it's really good quality data, yes, we can make some good discoveries. If a lot of the data is noisy and not so good, then right. it might be that it's just a, you know, a big flash in the pan. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, that, that brings me to a question that, Rafa's not here, but he had a question that he'd like to ask, which is sort of, <laughs> you know, he, he, uses the, he uses GEO and things like that to sort of collect those data and curate those data for projects he works on. And one thing that he's noticed is these are sort of all investigator-like projects, and they put their data on GEO, and the quality of sort of metadata, annotation, information like that is highly variable. Whereas, you know, do you think that it might be different, you know, top-down approach, data-generated by sort of a decision like this in the ENCODE project might be sort of better quality or at least better sort of curated than data that's sort of haphazardly generated by um, individual investigators? Probably not. I think, okay. well, I think what you get is you get an average. You get uniformity. I see. But you don't get, it, it's not uniformly the best quality. Okay. So it'd be great if it were, what you just suggested were true, that by right. getting everybody together, we would end up with all the data being finished and produced to the highest standards right. possible, mm -hmm. right. as well as being uniformly high right. standards. But I think right. you get uniformly good data. Right. So I, it, maybe it keeps the really bad stuff out. I'd be surprised even if you got uniformity. I mean, even yeah, for I would, a top-down type of project. I mean, I well, for the, and when you merge data sets together, which some of these projects did, then guess, it, gets, yeah. it gives you some uniformity. But yeah. there's, not a, there's, a, there's also a lot of, there are 30 papers, so there's yes. a lot of different types of data right. in there too. Yeah. Or the same types of data generated by different people, so it's not all going to be the same. Yeah. Right. I mean, my limited experience with these kinds of large consortia, it's hard to get everyone to agree on what the data should look like. And that, I mean, so even getting the agreement on uniformity is hard, and so what you end up with often is just a lot of different things anyway. Right. So. so can I come back to your previous question then? Absolutely, you can ask, yeah, we can just talk so about whatever. Yeah. The, I'm sorry the, if I the big, the, gun the big headline, 80% yeah. of the genome right. is, yeah. well, 80% of the genome is functional. 
That's been the, that's the, the headline. headline. And, yeah. and that's the way the press is reporting it because that's the way the NIH press release reported it. Right. That's the way the scientists who were interviewed talked about talked it. about it. With a few other things, said, this is Google Maps, and right. sure. as opposed to the human genome was the view of Earth from space, and now we have Google Maps. Right. Yeah. You know, creative, colorful kind of analogies, metaphors, uh, not really telling you much, but they right. s sounds good. Um, but the eighty percent, that's that's in the paper. That's very concrete, yeah. and that's supposed to be a surprise. So, um, first of all, we've known for a long time that junk DNA is not really a very accurate term to describe any part of our genome. It was coined a very long time ago, decades ago, and now it seems, and Mike Eisen made this point, I think, very well, that right. the only time you see the term junk DNA is when someone's pointing out that it isn't really true. Right. So it's always a straw man argument. It's never, no one's, I've, I haven't seen anybody in, in 20 years saying, oh, most of the genome is junk DNA. You don't see that. You just see people saying, now we know that less of the genome is junk DNA than we thought. Right. That's right. what it always is. So here's another giant paper saying it's even less. And, and, but the actual number they provided is not supported by their own data. It's very misleading what they're doing. They're you mean that he's quoting 80%? 80%. It's like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> Just because, you, well, well, the way that what they're calling functional, the definition of functional is the critical, critical part, yes. there, right? Like how they define that word so functional. So the biggest chunk of it is intronic DNA. Right. And I would not argue that that's functional. So we've known for a while that about half the genome, might be as much as 60%, but about half the genome is transcribed into pre-mRNA. Right. The vast majority of that is chopped out as introns and discarded and recycled by the cell. So the exons are only about 1.5% of the genome, and this paper didn't really change that number much. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said if you include the non-coding part, part of the exons, it might get up to 3%, but it's you know, probably 1.5%, 2% okay. is the part that goes into making proteins. Mm -hmm. okay. And introns are much bigger in human than exons. Those introns aren't functional to say that that's, they're calling that functional. That's, so that's part of their 80%. Right. They get transcribed. Okay. Um, so I, I would not in any way consider that to be functional. If, for example, if you lost an intron, would you still function just fine? Probably you would. We don't really know, but for most introns you could probably just lose them and you would, you would do Quite well. And we haven't read all the 30 papers, but it doesn't seem like, that, at least for the whole 80% number, that they've done the experiments to determine whether that's true. Right? Oh, sure whether the, yeah, whether sure they, you lose the intron and something changes. Well, no, 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 that's they, done. Yeah, they I, know, even, I mean, I know. I'm just saying, <laughs> well, they didn't for people who don't know that. about this, right? They didn't even re-examine that. They said that they started with 60% of the genome being in exons and introns, mostly introns. And then they claimed they've got another 20%, which yeah. is functional, which is in between those transcribed regions. Right. And that's from this large number of experiments they did which have, as far as we know right now, some amount of noise which has not been quantified very well. Uh, and I suspect that a large percentage of what they're calling functional is going to be noise. Mm -hmm. So they got a signal, so they said, okay, functional, because we got a signal in one of our many, many experiments. Right. So the, the big headline that they came up with, because they had to come up with a headline, mm -hmm. is at best misleading. And I think yeah. that all the scientists associated with the project know that this is misleading, so I'm troubled by that. By the fact that they're, that they're still why saying they feel, that, but... Why do they feel a need to say that 80% of the genome is functional? Right. If they know it's, if they know it's not true, yeah. Yeah. they shouldn't say it. Right. Just, they're, they're saying it because it gets them the headlines. It gets right. them into the New York Times, and right. maybe they felt like it helped them get the paper into nature. But I, you should never do that. You don't distort the science just to get into the headlines. Not well, it seems sort of interesting too. Another thing that I see in a lot of the, I've read a lot of the press around this too, and they talk about how you know, based on the science, we'll be able to sort of find the you know the, the mechanisms of the way to sort of cure cancer, to, you know, do the next you know, it's always about curing cancer is the next thing. And one sort of interesting thing is this is mostly done in cell lines, right? It's not done in it's necessarily in human populate where you actually take samples from a new human every time. You're actually sort of doing it in cell lines. I think it's all cell lines. So there, it seems like there, uh, is there going to be some sort of question about whether that's going to generalize to once we start actually getting human populations, the sort of the insights that we gain about the functional regulatory mechanisms of sort that's of... A, that's a very good point. Um, well, right. we'll see, but there's, yeah. there's, are there are certainly problems with generalizing from cell lines. Right. In ENCODE phase one, after the pilot phase, right. they selected cell lines for the purpose of having everyone work kind of on the same basic right. biological... To try to make it uniform. So yes, progress, yeah. for uniformity. 
And also it allows everybody to sort of share material. Right. If you have human subjects, then you know, getting hundreds of investigators all working on the same human subjects data is it's, it's very hard, yeah. Very difficult. So this simplified things. Yeah. So it was chosen for sort of practical reasons, but you're right, it makes the results maybe not as generalizable as they might be. Yeah. So I wonder if that plays into this whole big science versus small science that you know, what's the difference between having a hundred investigators studying sort of parts of this versus kind of a top down data generating mechanism that comes from Sort of encode or so. Well, I mean, so the idea that we're going to generate the data without any specific question in mind, so that to create a resource for other people. To it seems like a lot of the big sort of the big data like uh, discussion is around data sets like that that sort of you know are are big data in the sense that the data exists. Then the question comes after the data, sort of. Yeah. Well, then Roger makes exactly the right that's exactly the right question to be asking. So for the human genome and many many genome projects, that notion has been the sort of motivation for doing these big data generation projects and funding them, that we're going to generate this data, it only needs to be generated once, right. let's do it well, let's do it, get the best group to do it and, and give them the money and have them do it. This is not really at all applicable to the kind of experiments that are being done by most of ENCODE. Um, the, the experiments are, they are actually asking specific questions, or they should be, mm -hmm. and it's, in my view, these should all be, they can all be funded by normal investigator initiated grants, R01s from NIH. It's, in a way, I guess, easier to give out a few big grants. Perhaps that's a motivation. I don't know exactly what motivates the funders. But if you want to do, if you want to study uh, DNA, protein DNA binding sites in the human genome, I don't see why you need to have a resource generator to do that. These experimental techniques that are being used, the ChIP-seq and methyl-seq and uh, RNA-seq experiments and others that are being used by ENCODE, they're still immature. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of variance from one experimental lab to another, including these big labs. They haven't refined the techniques in some special way. Sequencing is very well under control compared to those kinds of experiments. So I suspect that we're going to find that most of the data that, that was released this week isn't really going to be that useful for very long because mm -hmm. people can get better at generating it. And then the data will just be better. And the data will be like, as, nobody's going to want to look at it. Because yeah. it's, it's using the old way of doing methyl C, and we have a better way of doing it now. So I am concerned because it looks like we're going to keep funding in code for many years to come. Right. So this project isn't, this isn't the end. So that was, no. that's one sort of impression you could get from this that this is sort of like we're the done. data got generated. Right. We made this big, you know, announcement. Yeah, all the papers right. and data are out there, and it's done. But that's not, you know, it's no, not. No, the no. End not of only it. is it that's not a guess. NHGRI is about to start the next phase. They've already they've okay. already reviewed the proposals. I don't know if they've actually announced the funding, but they're right. about to give out a whole big, you know, shovel full of additional money for this. These are still data generation. You're talking. You're not talking about data analysis. You're talking about data generation of this. They this do analysis too. They right. get plenty of funding for that. But right. more of this. Let's do these large-scale projects to characterize all the functions. Well, it's in code, you know, right. code phase Same. three or yeah. whatever. Right. And they'll give out the money in much, much bigger chunks than normal, and I think it's, uh, it's inefficient. Very, it's just the opposite of what they're trying to achieve. In terms of if you had investigators tackling each of these sort of on their own and producing their own sort of... Well, it's inefficient because it's, it, it's, it's anti-competitive. They have a huge amount of money going to a few centers. They'll do tons of experiments of the same type may not be the best place to do that. They could instead give that money to 20 times as many investigators who would be refining the techniques and developing better ones. And a few years from now, instead of having another set of encode papers, which we're probably going to have, right. we might have much better methods and would have, I think, just as much uh, in terms of discovery, probably more in terms of discovery from the data. Yeah, but there'd have to be some kind of QC if you do it that way, right? You're going to have quality control. If you're going to have 20 different people generating data in 20 different ways, well, it's just you kind of how science do. works. Right, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's... Well, so, so, I, so that's the, the debate between... So we do already. The, the There's a question to be asked about whether it's worth it to have this kind of massive snapshot of data that's kind of all been generated at roughly the same time, or whether you kind of have data sets that kind of come out over time by individual investigators, and meanwhile the methods are improving. And uh, I mean, here we, get, we have this massive snapshot all with kind of a uniform set of methods, that are kind of good at this time, but then maybe tomorrow someone comes with a new method and that's better. Or, I mean, yeah. well, I think that so I think a problem that that I have with it that that we're seeing in the way these papers came out is that uh, the top-down approach to doing science isn't the way you make discoveries. Yeah. And NIH has sort of said we're going to fund 
these data generation and data analysis groups that are doing both. There's a big analysis group yeah. that's part of the set of publications. Right. And by golly, we're going to discover some things. Right. It doesn't always work if you do that. You can't just say, so right. the human genome, even though, of course, there were lots of promises about curing cancer, right. we didn't say we're going to discover how a particular gene works. We said we're going to discover what the sequence is. Right. And we did. Yeah. Right. Really well. <laughs> With these projects, they said we're going to figure out the function of all the elements, and they haven't figured that out mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. What they figured out is here's some locations where something seems to be going on. Yeah. Here's right. a lot of locations where something seems to be going on. Right. They still don't know what's going on. We still, so we have to like dive into the details, and people need to work on individual sites in the genome and figure out what does this site do, and that's probably a smaller experiment. It's not some big scale thing. Mm -hmm. right. And you need someone who really understands the particular gene that that site sort of is affected by or contains, mm -hmm. and maybe applies 10 different techniques to figure out what that gene does and how it affects other genes that right. it's involved with. We don't need these large scale things for this kind of uh, this kind of a study. So we tried it. We did a pilot. We did a phase one. We did a phase two. Right. Enough already. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think we're going to figure out how all the functional elements work, work by top down science. Sort of the I just don't think it's going to happen. It might be the bottom up approach is a better way to go with that. The way that's been working for us for decades for all most right. science. All right. All right. Well, that thank you very much for coming and talking to us about it. It's been really interesting to hear your opinion. Thank so. You. Great, and we'd love to hear comments from everybody else who's, who's watching this and uh, what they think about it as well. So, That's right. thanks, thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot.